Praise the Lord. Um, tonight I want us to, uh, we, we'll be looking at um, the passage in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, what I would want to say before we go into that is that God always had a plan. God had always had a plan before the creation of the world. In no way can the world system, which the Bible says is run by the God of this world, be able to be able to manifest what God really intended to see in this world. God expected himself to be manifested in the world. His goodness, his graciousness, his love, his kindness. And there is no way that the world which is being dominated by the prince, by the prince of the power of the, of the air will be able to manifest that. So God has his people. And that has been his plan all throughout the ages to have his people who will be able to manifest him. Manifest him in the, in the, in the world. Um, so it becomes... It becomes a very sad, or it is a very sad situation where we have God's people come on the scene and not able to manifest what God say, what 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 God intends to be manifested. Today, you you enter places that are supposed to be the house of God or the church of God. What I'm using the word enter. Um, using the church premises as a symbol because the church is more than the, than the church premises. The people who are gathered in there, whether they are dispersed into their, into their various homes or not, still remain the church of God. But you, you go amongst them and most of the time you don't really find what God intends to be seen. What you're seeing is just a representation of the world in there among them but God has a higher purpose for the church which he purposed even before the creation of the of the world so when we look at scriptures like Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 just to uh, bring our minds to something reading from the verse 9 so we get the picture very clearly it says, and to make all men see what is a fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. If you read, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which reads, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So God intended that through the church, his manifold wisdom will be manifested. And in that same book of Ephesians, the grace of God is, is one of the things that God intends to manifest so clearly. And, and the grace of God, in a sense, also, also reveals the wisdom of God. That how mortal man, depraved and corrupt, will be able to manifest an aspect of God is a grace. We understand grace in a sense, to mean we come into faith, being saved from sin. It takes the grace of God. Because there's no way that de depraved man, man born in sin, conceived in sin, and raised in sin, will be able to, to, to come so close to God. But God has made it possible 
through Christ Jesus for it to be so. But there's more. God does not only want man to be is saved, is be able to approach him, but also to be able to manifest his goodness, manifest his virtues. And for this, the world cannot do it. So it falls on the church to manifest this. And God is looking up to the church to manifest this. And all this is still by grace. All this is still the work of grace. But sometimes people forget that although we are saved, we still live in this body. And so, like um, in Romans, it will, it, it will chapter right, it, it will say, we need to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify. Or we put the body, deny the body certain things. Because if we leave the body just to have its way, the beauty of Christ will be made. And we will not see the beauty as ought to be seen. That is why sometimes you hear certain, new, certain news and you wonder, where is the Christ we proclaim or profess or we, con or we confess? Um, I am not talking about maybe a believer sinning, falling into sin and coming out, but I'm talking about a persistent, regular lifestyle where people don't seem to see anything wrong and they just manifest when all this while god is expecting his grace the grace which he has made available to be manifested to the world okay um to put all that i'm saying in in a proper context i want us to go to philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 that God has brought us close to him by grace. And there, there are certain virtues of God, qualities of, of God that he wants manifested. The world can't manifest it. God is dependent upon the church to do that. As a testimony of his wisdom, how wonderful and how great he is. Like we read in Philippians, uh, in Ephesians 3, verse 10, to the intent that the principalities and powers would know the manifold wisdom of, of God. And this only the church can manifest it. So God is looking after the church to manifest his wisdom. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1. It begins by saying, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowel, bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not, on, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, when you look at the verse 1, it begins by saying, If there be therefore any consolation, if therefore be any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, If any bowels, 
Sorry, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bubbles and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. Hallelujah. For those of us who are in Christ, when we talk about the things of Christ, it's not just mere philosophical discussions. There are tangible experiences which back our claims of being in Christ. When we say we are, we, we are in Christ, we are not just filling the air with jargons and abstract thoughts and words and throwing words, words about. There are practical experiences. We really do experience Christ. Let me put it this way. If he says, if there be any consolation or encouragement, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. The expression, if any, does not mean he's questioning whether there is, it does not, say, uh, it does not mean that he's in doubt that there are consolations or encouragement in Christ. It also does not mean that he is in doubt whether there is any comfort or love that we experience in Christ. Or whether there, or whether there is any fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Whether there, 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 there is any fellowship with the Spirit of God. Or whether there are any bubbles of mercies in Christ. But he's rather affirming them. Um... If, if we look at Luke chapter 2, verse 10, in Luke 2, verse 10, when the angel came to announce the birth of Christ to the shepherds, Luke 2, 10 and 11, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Praise God. The scriptures again confirms in Hebrews 6 verse 17 that we have everlasting consolation in Christ. He says, Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirm it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that is through his promises and vows, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus also, in in his instructions to his disciples, in his instruction to the disciples, in John 15 verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Which means he has loved them. So when he's asking them to love, it is because he's loved them. They have experienced his love. There is great or even an enduring consolation in Christ. I bring to you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. It is not 
mere words. And in um, Romans 5.5, 5, we understand again that the Holy Spirit has shed abroad in our hearts the love of God. Praise the Lord. Again, let me read at Colossians 3 verse Colossians 3 verse 12. Colossians 3 verse 12. Praise the Lord. It says Put on, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And then he goes on to, to say, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also ye do. So also do ye. So basically, whatever he commands... When he says put on, put on does not mean invent, create yourself. Put on, put on. If someone walks into your room and says put on the, put the clothes on, it means the clothes are available. So when he says put on, it suggests that whatever he's aiming to put on is already available in Christ. So if there be any consolation, if there be any comfort of love, and we know in the book of Acts that the people were live in one accord. Some of them sold what they have and they, and they brought it to the church that it to be, it to be distributed. There, there is practical demonstration. So when we're talking about the virtues of, about, about, the, about the things of the gospel or of Christ, they are not mere philosophical words. They are practical things which we experience in Christ. Almost tangible. Because we experience them. We feel them. They are with us. So when he said, if there be any, he was not questioning whether it is, or he was not in, in, in doubt as to them being there or I'm not too sure whether it is there. Because in Christ, it, there is consolation in Christ. There is encouragement in Christ. There is joy in Christ. There is love in Christ. There are bowels of mercies in Christ. We have experienced all these. So it is based upon that, that the, that is scriptures, Moves on in verse, uh, in verse 2 of Philippians 2. He says, fulfill ye my joy. It is there. It is there. It, we are not to invent them. The, the love of Christ. We are, we, we are not to invent them. Because we can't invent it. The comfort of his love. The encouragement is there. The, the fellowship of the Spirit, we don't invent it. It says, if any fellowship of the Spirit. It should not mean, it does not mean he's in doubt. It is there. Fulfill my joy that ye be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Praise the Lord. So basically what he's saying is that leave, the, leave them out. I mean, let it, let it be seen amongst you because it is there. But it is there. But most of the time, the, the flesh is rather allowed to manifest and most people forget most people in the church forget that we we have all these we are we are experiencing all these virtues 
like I like what uh, First John says. Is it, is it, come and have fellowship with us. And please note that our fellowship is with the Son. So as you come to have fellowship with us, it is not just us. It is fellowship with the Son. You will experience the fellowship of the, of the Son. And, he's, and Christ says in John 56, As I have loved you, so love one another. Meaning what I've shown you is so practical. It's, it is there. I have provided it. So just make it manifest. Hallelujah. It is critical that it is critical that we that we manifest these things. It is critical that we uh, that we demonstrate this this oneness of mind. I mean harmony. He's talked about how he knows that what God has begun in them, he will finish it. Talk about the fact that because of the love of God that is in them, he's certain that God will complete his work because of the love. Because the love there is an indication. Then he comes to chapter 2 and then he says, let this oneness be among you. Fulfill ye my joy, being, one, being of one mind. Being of one mind does not necessarily mean we all think the same thing. <laughs> but whatever Christ has put before us, let's pursue it with oneness of mind. You may think, you may have your own way of thinking. You may, you may think in diagonal, in, di in diagonals. I may think in curves. But whatever way we think, as far as what, what Christ has commissioned us is concerned, we focus on it. We may have different opinions about things, but hey, when it comes to what Christ says we should do, we lay them all down and then we pursue this one thing. Because that is what matters. Because my feelings are temporal. Your feelings are temporal too. So uh, we can't go by your feelings. But we can go by the word of God. Because it changed not. His, the flower fades. And the grass withers. But the word of the Lord. Abides forever. Flesh. All flesh is as grass. So our feelings. Our thoughts. Our thinking. Our way of doing things. And our way of imagining things and all stuff, they are temporal. They come and go. The only thing that abides is the word of God. So what Christ has said is what we pursue and we leave all the other things behind. Because we, if we focus on any one of them, if I bring out a philosophical point or my feelings on the table and we decide to follow it, woe unto us. We ain't going to go very far and we realize, oh, we're in the wrong. But let's hold on. Let's, lay, let's capture what God wants us to deal with and put our energies, put our passions, put, our, put everything in us. I mean, our anger, just channel everything towards it. That one goal, that one vision that Christ has laid hold of us. Let's Put everything in and we surely not going to fail. Hallelujah. So the virtues that he mentions here are critical. They are the results of union with Christ. The oneness of mind. The harmony. The, the one accord. The love. They are virtues of, they, they, they are the result of union with Christ. If we are in one accord with Christ, because our fellowship is with Christ. When we are in that one accord, that union with him, they will result. They will be the automatic outflow. Praise God. The, the apostle writing to this church 
says that if these things are a manifestation, let's see how, how serious it is. Verse 15, Philippians 2 verse 15, verse 16. Verse 16. He says, if these things are in manifestation, as he goes on talking, talking, he, he gets to verse 16 and, and then he says, holding for the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. If these things are in manifestation, then and only then do I know I have not run in vain. What can we say pertaining to those that have Communicated the word of God, the pure word of God unto us. That if these things are in manifestation, then we know that their efforts have not been in vain. Then Christ's running has not been in vain. Then Christ hanging on the cross has not been in vain. Then his labors have not been in vain. When he shouted, it is finished, has not been in vain. Praise God. Listen to Jesus' prayer. Paul says this, but listen to Jesus', Jesus prayer in John 17. John 17, 21. Christ gives the same picture. John 17, 21. He says, He says, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent to me. So he says, if there is that oneness amongst them, it is then that the world will know that my claim as a Messiah, as a mediator between God and man, is true. That the world would acknowledge that there is indeed that oneness. Praise God. That there is no reconciliation between God and man except through Christ Jesus. He says it will only be manifested to the world. That the world will know this. As they bond together as one. But this oneness is only possible. As we glue together with Christ Jesus. It is only in our union with it. the world cannot manifest this. They would have a form of oneness. But when you go in, when you dig a bit deeper, you realize that it is not so. It is only the church that can manifest. An assembly that is together, an assembly that is one, that is harmonious, that have the love of God manifesting shining like the glittering of um, silver or gold because the one who has taken hold of us is such that we cannot do otherwise but manifest who he is to God be the glory hallelujah he continues, let's, let's continue, let's continue. That what he's talking about here, it is only the church that can manifest it. I, I would bet my life on this. Give me any organization. That is, not the, that is not the true church of God. And they seem to have this oneness amongst them. And we will go in with a litmus test. And you will discover the greatest selfishness amongst them. You would realize that even though, because man being, man is depraved and we can't deceive ourselves. So the only place, the only place that you can have complete one is really functional or this, this love manifested is in, in the church among God's people. That's the only place you can find it. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Because the, in there, we are in union with Christ. And in union with him, what is in him flows down. Here, what the apostle is doing is making the church aware. So they will not allow the 
their humanity to, to overshadow what is really happening amongst them. That they will let whatever Christ is doing, what the Spirit of God is doing, manifest, come out. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by His Spirit. It is in there. All we got to do is to, hey, to be aware that the flesh can, can come and show itself forth. So what we need to do is to become aware that we don't allow it. In verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. So, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, the other better than themselves. So here, the church is, is to make sure that they undertake all their duties and responsibility in a selfless manner. In a selfless manner. And the only place this can happen is in the, is in the church. Because the church is in fellowship with Christ. The world cannot demonstrate this. The world cannot do this. Because, hey, it is governed by the prince of the power of the, of the air. The systems of our world. The other day someone, I was listening to, 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 a, to a discussion and someone just dropped that thing, just dropped this text that, that the world system, I mean, um, when the Bible says that um, the world is being controlled by the prince of the power of the, of the air, talking about the world system. And it hit me. I said, oh my goodness, the Bible says so. It means that the systems of the world, I mean, all the systems of the world that we can name, is all being controlled by the, by the prince of the power of the, of the air. So certainly, we can't find the virtues of Christ there. Their works on the on the front, it, it may look very, very wonderful, glamorous, but just pour a little bit deeper, and you see all kinds of diabolical things going on on there. Someone will come and say, "Oh, I I donate a, a million pounds to this charity," and for all you may know, he's got billions stacked away for himself. Oh, how wonderful he is. You, don't, you have no clue what he's touched away for, him, for himself. It is only in the church that we can have selfless feet and deeds. Only in the church. Do nothing out of strife. To strive means to struggle with someone. Or a group for superiority. You're struggling with someone else. You, you want to have the upper hand. Or with a group. And the sad thing is. Sometimes some people strive. With other people. When the other people are, are not even aware. They are being striving with. And that, and, and that is so sad. Someone is trying to compete. Strong, and the other person might not even be aware. Because he's complete. Because they that are complete. Don't compete. He is complete in Christ. One reason why I say those who are in union with Christ manifest oneness and do undertake their responsibilities and their duties selflessly is because my Bible says that we are complete in Christ. So there's nothing else that we are seeking for. Because we are complete in Him. It is those who are not complete who try to pop up by certain things that they can do to feel okay. But we are already okay. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's. Like Christ, he was okay. He was okay. So he was able to lay the garment down. He was able to put a towel around his waist and begin to 
clean the feet of the, of the disciples, of his servants. Because he had nothing to lose. But those who are not complete, they always think that some, by having yours, they'll become complete. But they do, they do not understand that nobody can complete another person. No human being can complete another human being. Only Christ. You know, those who do, those who indulge in their voodoo, you know, they keep on doing their atrocious acts. They keep on doing it, thinking that by killing someone and, and probably drinking their blood or maybe having their head and drinking their blood, thinking that by that act, they get the other person's powers and they become more powerful. But they keep doing it. They are never satisfied because no human being can ever satisfy another human being by trying to get what he has. You can get, if, 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 a, if, if a person ever makes the mistake of thinking that he's not getting enough respect, so has to put on an act or a show to get respect for some people, you would do and do, you will never have enough. You will never get enough of it. The only person who makes us complete is Christ. And in him we have it. But it is when we take our eyes off him, which many in the church do, they take their eyes off Christ. Then they begin to see flaws, so many loopholes. Yes. In the garden we saw a very, a very good picture of it. When they were obedient and following the, the word of God, as God has said, the command of God, they, 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 they didn't see any nakedness. But the moment they turned their eyes off and ate the forbidden word God said they, they, they shouldn't do, then they saw their nakedness. So anytime a man begins to see his nakedness and begin to, who is born again, I'm not talking about the depraved man. A man who is born again, you begin to see that you are in need of something. You, you, are, you are trying to, to struggle to get something. You, you feel that people don't do this towards you enough. People don't do to, this towards you enough. It's probably because you've maybe moved your eyes off Christ. Because he makes you complete. So you don't compete with nobody. According to 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, um, seeking and um, st striving and vain glory are at best work, work, works of the flesh. They are at best work, works of the flesh. In James, again in James 3, 14 to 16, we are told that Wherever there is strive is, let me read it. It says that, he says, but if you have, James 3, 14 to 16, but if you have bitter envy and strive in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from, from, from above, but is earthly, is sensual. For where envy and strive is, there is confusion and every evil work. It is when there is strive and vain glory and all that is not from, that wisdom is not from above. When a person is struggling to, to get the upper hand and be the top man, be the best, people are doing all kinds of stuff. It happens in the workplace. But in the, though among those who are in union with Christ, it doesn't happen because they are complete. But those who are not, comp those who have taken their eyes off Christ will not begin to seek something. To God be the glory who makes us complete. Hallelujah. In, in chapter 1 verse 15. Philippians. 
You remember Paul was saying that some people preach out of envy? Out of envy and strife because they saw him as being in the forefront. Paul the apostle, Paul the apostle, wherever you go, Paul the apostle, among the Gentiles, his, his, name, shall, his name seems to have become a household name. And they thought, no, something must be done. Now that he's in prison, this is our chance to preach and also get a, get, get a name for ourselves. Preaching out of envy. But Paul says, hey, whatever I ca- in whatever I case, the gospel is being preached. So I, re- I rejoice. You see, you see, he's in union with Christ. He's complete in Christ. Not that he doesn't care, but that he won't compete. When the Corinthians forces him to make a boast about who he is, he said, do you know what? As, let me speak like a fool. Are they apostles? I am. Are they, are they ministers, ministers of the gospel? I am more. And then he began to show how he's a minister of God. I thought he was going to talk about the rings on his finger, the big puff ring on the right finger. Because now when I, walk, when I turn to the Christian channel, I see most people with uh, this big ring on. And, and I wonder, what is he about? What is it? About this big, ring, this big ring on your little finger. And you see, if you are, if you are a minister of God, you got to wear um, a, a shirt that has got a very big color. So maybe what I'm wearing that doesn't really make me one. Because one actually told me, you know, if you, if you want to appear on TV as a, as, a minister, as a minister, you've got to have this, this shirt that comes from Italy. I mean, it's got, it goes up high. So these are the qualifications of a, of a, of a minister. And you've got to have the, you know, you've got to have the, um, the letter style of speaking, speaking a certain way, and you have the mic and have to show up. But when Paul, in, when, when he was describing himself as a minister of the gospel, it amazed me. He talks about things like being beaten five times, being in prison, being among false brethren, being shipwrecked. And I thought, my goodness, what a, what a, what, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a complete contrast. In the things that are supposed to be suffering. And he calls himself a prisoner of Christ. One I know definitely. It was a Jew's workings and the Romans that had put him in jail. He calls himself a prisoner. That's he, 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 he will not even complain that the Jews have put me in prison. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ. It is preaching the gospel that has put me there. But he doesn't see it as an accident. He sees it as part of being a minister. Because Christ says, he says, they will throw you in, the, in, the, in prison. You will appear before the synagogues. I mean, they will throw you in prison and they will persecute you. So he saw it as part and parcel of serving Christ. In that, he found completeness in that. But some people in our day who have taken their eyes off Christ, of the gospel, who say, ah, why? Why me? Why? While the, the ministers in the scriptures are, are, are qualifying their ministry by the challenges they are going through, today, people run themselves down by these same challenges and say, oh, God has forsaken them. When by these same things, people qualify themselves as ministers of the gospel. Because they are complete. So whether they do menial jobs or they don't, they are complete. Whether they have their upper place or not, they are complete. I have learned to abound and I have learned to abase. 
complete in Christ. To God be the glory. It is amazing. It is amazing. So he says, let nothing be done through vain glory or through strife. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Basically, instead of becoming self-centered and seeking the best for yourself, have their mind such that these brothers of mine deserve the best. What I am dishing out to them should be the best. Hallelujah. Amen. Not that I do it anyhow and then as long as I'm satisfied, it's, it's okay. No. But how would they find it? Would it lift them up? I'm not talking about being a people pleaser. But would it edify them? Because the Bible instructs us that whatever we say should edify the saints. Our words should be gracious that it lifts them up. Sometimes it will challenge them. Lift them up. Edify them. Oh, whatever I am doing, should I just think about myself? No. If it concerns others, then I have to be concerned about them. Praise God. And then he says in verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Instead of having an exaggerated opinion of oneself or being blinded by one's personal needs alone, the church is encouraged to seek what will be of encouragement, strength, and blessing to one another. What will bless one another? So I'm not to look onto my own things. Hallelujah. So basically, I'm to seek that which will bless other people. Instead of capitalizing on the weaknesses of other people, I should rather, I should rather think of lifting them up. Praise the Lord. Praise God. This is what harmony involves. Harmony and oneness requires that I think of lifting up the one who is weak. The one whose needs might be wobbling. Harmony and oneness requires that I strengthen it. Bible says, says in Isaiah, a bruise, a, flo uh, a smoking, um, a, a, a smoking wax. Flax, he will not quench. A smoking flax, he will not quench. A bruised reed, he will not break. When it's about breaking, when it's so fragile, he will say, oh, this is useless, just cut it off. No, it will strengthen it. That is what those in union with Christ do. They don't crush, they don't break, they don't destroy. The strengthening. They cause to stand on their feet. I like a song that uh, Helen Baylor sang some time ago, the, the Wounded Soldier. He said, The people of God will not let another wounded soldier die. They will be the Samaritan, uh, they will be the neighbor of the, of the Samaritan. They will, put the, they will pour in the oil and they will bind the wound. They will nurse it. They will put him in a motel and pay a deposit for his accommodation. And then they will say to the innkeeper, take care of him. If what I've given is not enough, I'll come back 
and pay the rest till he is completely whole to run the race again. Hallelujah. Amen. We do not run down. We do not cut short. Because the scripture says, a smoking flask, he will not quench. He will guard it. He will prevent the air from completely dying it out. He will guard it. So that it begins to flame again. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. I, read, I want to read a text in um, 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, 22. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are, necess are necessary. Are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we should Upon this we bestow more abundant honor, and our, our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the parts which lack, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored. All the members rejoice with it. To God be the glory. And we see how in John 13, Christ Jesus served the disciples. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Then when we go to verse 5. So, these are the things that he says adds to harmony, adds to oneness, um, contributes to the, to the love feast or the unity feast or the unity of the spirit. And he says, it is there. Fulfill my joy by manifesting these things. That means get, God gets glorified. I started by saying that so that to the intent that the principalities and powers might know the manifold wisdom of God. As the church began to manifest these things, we would wonder how is this possible? Humans? Humans to manifest this? Unbelievable. How can depraved man manifest this? And all goes back to the glory of God. That God has done a wonderful work. That you and me, in union with Christ, are able to love selflessly. Give ourselves selflessly. Praise God. The apostles did it. That same spirit dwells amongst us. We can do it. Hallelujah. Amen. We can. And then he goes on. And then he says. Let this mind be in you. Verse 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the church is not, the church's mind is being drawn to manifesting the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? He goes on to give us what Christ did. But let me say it in few words. It is that mind that was sacrifice and deny itself of all honor or dignity in order to please God. It is that mind that will sacrifice and deny itself of all honor and dignity in order to please God. And then when he goes down in verse 6, 
He says, who, that's Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a, of a, of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory. So where there is a task to be done for the glory of God, the mind of Christ forsake its honor, its personal honor. There's something to be done. The souls to be edified, souls to be rich, lives to build up in Christ, a task to be done to the glory of God. It forsakes its honor. It forsakes its own misery. It might even be weeping over something. Once the clarion call comes, it stops weeping, arms itself, and say, let's get going. It does not stay back. And wallow in sorrow and no, 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 I'm, I'm down. No, it gets itself up. Say, let's go. Hallelujah. Amen. It gets the work done. Praise God. It adapt its it adapts itself to whatever is needed to get God's heart's desire done. That's the mind of Christ. To God be the glory. You see, God exalted Jesus, which was not an accident. What I mean is, it's not, oh, after doing this, then Christ didn't realize there was something like that. And then oh, Christ knew what was, what was at stake. I mean, he knew. Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I will go through this. That through me, all these people will come into fellowship with God. That the purpose of God, that the intent of God, that the good heart of God shall be revealed through him to all humanity. That the goodness of God will be made available to humanity. I bring to you Good tidings of great joy, the angel said in Luke 2. Good tidings of great joy. So proud to that, the world has not experienced it yet. I bring to you good tidings of great joy. I will go through it. And then through me, all men may come to know God and experience his goodness. All, every other name shall be silent. That is why we can boldly say there's no name given among men under heaven whereby any man shall be saved except through the name Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That is meant to encourage us that as he, went through, as he obediently humbled himself and went through all the suffering and um, went through all that complied with God in, in, his, in his humanity, complied with God, laid himself down, did not try to compete with, when God says Christ, pass here, is it, no, but you, what you mean? Uh, uh, when God says, do this, uh, but when they slap him and he has to keep quiet, but I can command legions and come and devastate all these people. No, you can't. Keep quiet. Endure it. He suffered. He went through it. A whole God. People would attempt to throw stones at him and then he was, he was kind. He could have stayed. And then when they threw, threw the stones, the stones would just pass through him and go and, and fall down, displaying power. But he laid all this down. He could have told God, but why are you doing this? I can't, let me, I'm also God. Let me, let me do, let me show these people some, something. 
but he laid himself down and went through whatever the father instructed. Knowing what it was at stake. To God be the glory. It was not an accident. It wasn't an accident. You see, so this is, this, this, this is meant to encourage us that as we also put the flesh down, because the flesh will always, God, we live in this body. Hey, we're never going to, people, some, some, some people try to be spiritual. They try to be spiritual. They do so many things to be so spiritual and think that they will ever escape this body. Hey, we will never escape this body. It is here with us. We, it is here with us. What we need to do is to make sure that we always keep it out of the way. It will always want to, the old nature will always want to come up. Keep it out of the way. Because we know there is something ahead of us. As Christ was glorified, so shall we. Hallelujah. So shall we. Because as we humble ourselves, Bible says that God abases the proud, but, but he exalts the humble. We shall be, we shall also experience our exaltation. I'll sh show you something. Philippians 3 verse 21. Philippians 3 21, the same book. It says, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. To God be the glory. We shall also, after we've gone through all this, after we've laid down the body, after, after we have mortified the deeds of the flesh, after we have not allowed the body when it wants to show up, to say, hey, come on, lay down. Christ must be exalted. We must, I mean, in our union with Christ, as we allow the love of God to manifest, the, the, the humility of Christ to manifest, we lay down all these things, we know there is, there is a glorification coming. A day is coming. We shall also receive glorified bodies. A day is coming, we will put down this body completely. A day is coming, we will, we will, we will also receive that glorified body too. To God be the glory. First Corinthians 15, 48 says, As the earthy, such are they also that are of the earth. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are, are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Praise God. Now, this I say, brethren, that the flesh, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption. And this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the, the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. Amen. A day of glory awaits us. A day of victory awaits us. Praise God. He causes us to triumph as we go on this journey. But as we, as, as, we, as we humbly and obediently follow what God requires and, uh, and live in a harmony, I mean, go move in oneness of mind and, and, and do as God requires, as Christ was exalted, so shall we also one day put this body down and receive that glorified body. And live with the Lord forever and ever. Hallelujah. A day of glory is coming. For the glory that is laid ahead of us. Let's also endure what is put before us. Hallelujah. Let's endure it. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. So let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That we will sacrifice, we will deny, and 
anything, as long as it pertains to the glory of God, as long as it will bring glory to God, we give ourselves to it. Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded. Hallelujah. That you be like-minded. Having one having been in, been in, been in, been, been in one accord and being of the same love which we have experienced in Christ Jesus. And this he challenges us to do are things that are already in Christ Jesus. And through fellowship with him, we are able to manifest them. We are able to manifest them. Praise God. The world cannot do it. Those who have got their eyes off Christ cannot do it. We've got to keep our eyes on Christ. Focus upon him. And we'll be able to manifest them. To God be the glory. For God is looking unto us to manifest his wisdom. To manifest his glory. Manifest his grace which he has shown us to the, to the whole world. Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. I will continue with this later on. Um, I think there there is more more to look at, but I'll 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 look at them at another time. So we thank God for this. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for what you've given us tonight. The word that that has come tonight. We ask that as we leave this place, we will live knowing that our union with Christ has exposed us to the encouragement in Him, the love in Him, fellowship with the Spirit, and the bowels of mercies, that we are able to manifest them. For this is your heart desire. For this reason, you've called us. For this reason, you've saved us. That we will manifest them. Help us, Lord, that we will always be mindful of this. That we have a mission. We have a call. We have a purpose to exhibit from you. The world cannot do it. Only the church. you father for this privilege and by your spirit we will live this life to your glory we pray in the name of Christ Jesus if there's anyone sick in any part of their body we pray that the healing power of God will reach them wherever they are in the name of Jesus make them every with whole wherever Lord God wherever there are challenges Wherever people have, have taken their eyes off Christ. And so there's all strive and envy and all kinds of things going on. Lord, we pray that you help by, by your spirit regain their focus on Christ Jesus. This we pray for all Christendom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.